It's just kind of like a happy accident where I was trying to solve my own problem. I threw it up on Indie Hackers for 99 bucks at the time and I sold like three copies in the first month. Then I was like, oh, well, maybe I have a, <laughs> uh, maybe I have a, a product here. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Indie Bites, the podcast where I you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. Today I'm joined by Kyle Gawley, who is the founder of Gravity, which he's bootstrapped over $25,000 a month. In 2012, he scaled a VC-backed company called Get Invited to 5 million in sales, before unfortunately a near-death experience made him rethink how he lived his life. Now Kyle is traveling the world, building his bootstrap sass. Now, just this morning, I got back from playing tennis and I knew that I probably wouldn't speak to another human for quite a few hours. That was quite weird and it made me a little bit sad. I really do love working at home, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss being around people every day. But the silver lining on this thought, however, was that I knew I'd be meeting up with my bootstrapper friends tomorrow in London to co-work as part of the Ramen Club community, who are sponsoring today's episode. A day of bouncing ideas with each other, accountability to get my tasks done for the day, and the all-important spontaneous coffee walks. It's just something I really look forward to. But there is more than just the co-working session in London. I've met some of my best friends through the Slack who I've actually never met in person, learned how to file my taxes through the in-house fractional CFO, and saved thousands of dollars worth of Stripe credit and the discounts available as part of being a member. So come join me and my friends at Ramen Club. Head to ramenclub.so, hit the link in the show notes, use code IndieBytes to save some money off your first month. Oh, and also we are now on YouTube. Just search IndieBytes on YouTube and you can find the video versions of the pod if you like that. Kyle, welcome to the pod. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you very much for the, the invitation. Good to have you. So let's talk about your start out in the VC world, your ambitions to build this big VC back company. Why did you want to go down that route? I, I kind of fell into it, to be honest, because I was I was very young. I was a student. Me and my, my co-founder was also a student on the, the same course as me. And we built this software product and it kind of just it took off. We got some traction. Our university made an investment in the product in the condition that we could get a VC to, to match the funding. We went out, we pitched. We got a VC on board and it, I didn't really, I didn't even know what bootstrapping was. At that point, I had just gone from university straight into this, this VC world without really any understanding of the, of what the landscape was like. What did you enjoy most about doing this VC back company? Because sometimes in the bootstrapping community, it seems like people are trying to build a better life themselves, but they don't have as much ambition with their projects and I've sort of fallen into that myself I want to get to a point where my life is better but I don't want to go much beyond that so did you like that part of VC or do you think there's a balance to strike I mean there's definitely a lot of things I, I liked about it it was at the time I was I was doing a lot of travel I was spending a lot of time in San Francisco I was going to big events I was meeting a lot of cool people and that's obviously very expensive to to do so the vc money helped with a lot of that travel it really helped me build a good network because this this was almost 10 years ago so like twitter wasn't as popular then the community wasn't as strong online a lot a lot of my original network was built in person so i really enjoyed that aspect of it i love traveling i love meeting different entrepreneurs in different countries i get to go to some really cool places and meet cool people obviously it was very stressful as as well i think that there's this mentality that you've got vc money the the startup journey is is going to be less stressful but a lot of times that money is running out very quickly and it it brings a whole lot of other stressors with it that I haven't experienced while bootstrapping. Yeah, so you, you touched on stress there. You told this story on the Indie Hackers pod. So tell that story. Tell, tell me what happened. Um, basically, I was sick for about five years. I had this stomach infection in my stomach that, that didn't respond well to stress. It took a long time for it to be diagnosed for for some reason that I've never I've never fully understood and then one day my stomach basically ripped I started vomiting blood and then I had to go to hospital I had to get the camera down my throat and then they eventually found out what was wrong with me it was very easily treated I think the most frustrating part of the whole experience was it all could have been avoided if it was properly mm. diagnosed at the the beginning but I think everything happens for a reason and I, and I learned a lot from five years of suffering 
Man, that sounds awful. So did that make you rethink your life and what you wanted to do? It took me a few months to recover. And then I went to Thailand on holiday for a month, kind of like a working holiday type thing. And then I fell in love with this idea of being a digital nomad. And then that's when in 2017, I decided to go traveling for nine months and went to four or five different countries to live and work. And at that, that point, were you, were you doing Get Invited still or had you sort of started to transition to Gravity in your side projects? I was, I was still working on Get Invited, but I, I was wanting to experiment with something else. And then I kind of I built a boilerplate to help me prototype and launch ideas quickly. And then that's uh. how Gravity was born. It was just kind of like a happy accident where I was trying to solve my own problem did you have plans to turn this into a full-time thing I, I know you priced it cheap to start off with no i basically just built it to to help me build other products quickly and then i met a guy in a co-working space here in Chiang Mai. he told me about a couple of other competitors in different languages and then i just i, I threw it up on indie hackers for 99 bucks at the time and i sold like three copies in the first month then i was like oh well Maybe I have, a, uh, maybe I have a, a product here. <laughs> so for the non-technical out there, me included, Kyle, how does gravity work? Who would use it? Who would pay now $900 and where's the value there for me? So basically, it's a template that helps startups and founders to prototype and build their applications faster. Mm. It's going to save them weeks, possibly even months of time when it comes to building their own products because it has a lot of the boilerplate or common functionality already created for them. Now, pricing is an interesting thing with Gravity because, as you said, you start off at $99. In the first month, getting three sales at that price is is already impressive. But you had an Indie Hackers post which said, I raised my prices like 800%. And now it's n almost $900 for the boilerplate. How, what are your thoughts on charging more, increasing prices? And were you surprised as you just kept increasing that price and people get paying? Yeah, it was it was, it was was a huge surprise. I mean, the more I increased the price, the more people purchased it. But th there's a good reason for that. And I think that when, when someone's buying something like Gravity and they're going to they're gonna use this as the foundation for their business, they want something solid. And, and I think most founders that purchase it know that if they were paying me $10 or $100, they're maybe not going to get the same quality and they're definitely not going to get the same level of support. I think they know when they're paying more if they have a question or anything goes wrong, that it's going to be fixed quickly. You know, they've got direct access to me on Slack. So if there is any issues or anything, it's always fixed like very quickly. And I think I think a lot, I think certain customers understand that I'm paying, I'm paying more, I'm, I'm going to get more value or I'm going to get faster, better support. Not everyone understands that, but the, the people yeah. that I'm targeting, they, they definitely do. It's interesting the cheaper you seem to go, especially when you get down to this consumer ten dollar a month level, the more the perceived value is reduced you get. It attracts a certain type of customer versus someone that's paying nine hundred dollars for a boilerplate. Yeah, I it, it definitely does. And I and I experimented with a light version of Gravity at one point, which was like forty seven dollars. Mm. It was a very stripped down version and it attracted this the, the wrong types of people and then I I've long got rid of that plan. I only want to work with people at this price point. Now, I'm sorry to bring this to funnels, Kyle, but I was thinking about this. So you've got a high ticket item and I sell podcast edits at a similar price. And I know that there is a certain level of nurture. I hate that word, but it is. There's a certain level of I've got to find a way of then having a conversation before the sales happens. Have you put much thought into funnels and how you get people in the top of the funnel and how you nurture them to eventually buy? Yeah, I suppose it's, it's the, I think Russell Bronson talks about this idea of the, the value mm. Ladder. So you could be selling these premium products. You need to give somebody, you need to give somebody something at a lower cost to get them on that ladder. At the moment, I don't have any of those cheaper products. I think last year I was experimenting with a book idea, which I then kind of canned because there was more more people were asking me to produce a course than to write a book. I, I think that lower end of the funnel for me is probably Twitter. The issue for me is more trust. It's it's building the trust that somebody's gonna you know it's gonna be happy to pay nine hundred dollars for a boilerplate. So I invest a lot of time mm. into into branding and, and building trust and a good reputation. 
So Twitter's been a good source of customers and that top of funnel for you. Where else have customers been coming from? Is Twitter like the main place or is there other places that are sort of similar or beyond that? SEO. So like at the start, I wasn't using Twitter as heavily as I am now. I was just relying mostly on SEO. Also, Indie Hackers has been a good source of customers for me as well. But now Twitter is, is becoming a pretty good channel for me too more so now that i've been investing a lot more time and energy into building an audience so i i asked this off air about your pricing structure because you say you've got a hybrid model of SaaS and one-time purchases so uh, like i found a post from you a few months ago saying you're on 25k no point sharing it beyond that but explain to people the hybrid model that you've opted for so I sell I sell the boilerplate. It's currently yeah. at eight nine eight nine five, and then that gets you a lifetime license to use the boilerplate and one year of Slack access and updates. After that year, if you want to continue getting updates and have access to me and the support, then you pay a, an annual subscription of of one nine five, which gets you another year of product updates and support. And when did you introduce that? Has that been a worthwhile thing for you? Does it give a little bit more stability to your income? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have it at the start. I think at the start, mm. I was just doing life, lifetime licenses, and then I, I think a couple of customers were sent to me on Slack. They were like, "Hey, the guy, I've, I've paid this fee, and I've got you know three or four versions in one year. I will be happy to pay more." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay," because you've got the main part of the product is this one-time purchase does that mean your income is going up and down do you find it quite stressful with it going up and down or do you find it's quite steady like at a threshold maybe you get 10k every month and it goes up and down beyond that it, it does go up and down. It's been a bit turbulent in the last few months. I think it has for yeah. for everyone. I mean, in the first year, it, it was all over the place. It kind of did balance out a little bit. Um, it's been growing year on year. This year's been a really good year. I wouldn't say it's completely unstable or, or unpredictable. It just varies from, from month to month. What does life look like in the future for Kyle? Do you want to just carry on working on gravity? You've got a good life with it. Do you want to sell it off and do other ideas? That's a good question. And I'm obviously very vocal on Twitter about, you know, being very focused on, on one thing. The thought of selling it is, has crossed my mind, but, but I, I enjoy it. And I, I want to add more, more ways to add value to the same audience and the, the mm. same customers and that's kind of what I did with the course as well. I have lots of ideas for different things, but I try to I try to keep myself focused and make sure everything's under the gravity brand and everything's connected. So uh, interesting point you made there. Adding more fuel to the roaring firing debate that is having multiple projects or a single focus. It's a delicate debate. The the issue I have it is a lot of indie hackers seem to they launch something they get it to like a couple of hundred dollars of revenue, which is which is great. And that is, in my mind, that's the point. You want to start doubling down and trying to grow it. But then they're just like, they get shiny object syndrome and then they're, they just <laughs> start working on something else. I, I think that approach is, is problematic. I mean, if you have built something and it's become very successful and then you want to create another product and because many businesses have different products, I mean, that makes sense to me, but when it's just loads of different disconnected products in different markets and it's all over the place, there's no cohesive strategy, that, that's what I have an issue with. Okay, that that's a nice bit of nuance to the debate. People building disconnected things, whereas you with gravity, you might do something like your course, but it is it's under the gravity brand. It is to help get more sales for the boilerplate. Ultimately, it's serving the same set of customers. Carl, you mentioned a little side project you were doing, and I've been thoroughly interested in AI tools. So tell me about this AI graphics generator you've been playing with recently. Yeah, and this, this probably sounds contradictory to what I've just said yeah, about the, <laughs> the small bets. I, I've been so interested in AI, I just wanted to learn about it. And the best way for to do that in my mind is just to, to create a project. Because so I was quite inspired by Peter Level's interior AI. So it was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a logo generator or something something simple. So I just started playing around with it. I put it online. And now it started to get some traction so people are actually using it it's starting to cost me money to run and now <laughs> the thought is in my mind of is there a product 
idea here? And if there is a product idea, is, does it relate to the same audience? Can it be under the, the brand? I don't know the answers to any of those questions. This just started as a as an experiment for me to for me to get new skills. Are you making much money from yours? Are you charging for it? I I'm, I haven't charged anything. Okay. I basically just put it online as an experiment. I put like a limit on it. You can generate five images and then you got to sign up. But now people are starting to yeah. sign up, and it's been like fifteen hundred images generated. So tomorrow I'm gonna put a paywall in place because that, that's the next thing I need to test. Is anybody gonna is anybody gonna pay for this? Well, I hope they do. Carl, it's been great chatting, but I end every podcast on three recommendations. A book, a podcast, and an indie hacker. Carl, hit me with your recommendations. I think books, Arvid Carl's book, Zero to Soul, it's probably one of my favourite books. Indie hacker, it's definitely got to be Peter Levels, especially at the minute with the AI stuff that he's, he's shipping and his, his hit rate. And for podcasts... Obviously, it's going to be Indie Bites. Oh, thank you, man. And you, you said you also listen to Indie Hackers too. Well, Carl, appreciate you joining me on Indie Bites. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Indie Bites. All links to everything discussed will be in the show notes. As always, a thank you to today's sponsor, Ramen Club. And finally, if you have a podcast but editing takes up all of your time, drop me a message to help you out. I run a podcast editing service called Podpanda to help you get your time back and fire up your production value. That's all from me. See you next week.